Now, I want to digress a little bit here. A lot of times, folk, you will believe one way when you're operating on this level of knowledge. Get a little bit more knowledge, you start believing the other way. Then get even more knowledge and go back to where you originally were. I've seen that occur in the field of medicine. Primitive medicine was called herbal medicine, where they emphasized herbs. Then they said, oh no, herbs, that's primitive. So we got a bit more knowledge, we tend to throw the herbs out and go with real medicines. Then we got even more knowledge. And guess what? You go to a drugstore today and what do you see? A lot. Oh, a lot of herbs. We're going back to herbs again. Any of you seen it? Oh, right, now, back to what does this have to do with Copernicus? Simply this. The Earth is not the center of the solar system. The Earth is not the center of the galaxy. But as we look around, what appears to be the center of everything? anybody know. I mean, everywhere we look in the heavens, the universe seems to be expanding away from, does anybody know what's it expanding away from? The earth itself. Is the earth the center of the universe? Now somebody has said, oh, well, we just have only observed from earth. If we were able to observe from one of these really distant galaxies, anywhere you are in the universe will appear to be the center of the universe. I'm not sure that's true and we can't prove it. You do have to do what's called thought experience. Now granted, if we were in a nearby galaxy like Andromeda or the Magellan Clouds, the universe would not appear much different than it does from here. But suppose we're on some really, really, really distant galaxy, many, many millions of light years away, would they still view Earth as the center of the universe, or would they view their own sphere as the center of the universe? Again, we don't know. Um, the ancients told us the Earth was the center of everything. They may have been right. All right. Moving on, the next person was Kepler. Now before I start talking about Kepler, I want and I thank all of you for moving this phenomenon. Your car is stopped at a stoplight, and all of a sudden your car starts to roll backwards, and you know it's going to hit the car behind you. And you hit the brakes and hard, and I no matter how hard you, you can't get your car to stop going backwards. No, the car beside you is moving forward. And to your point of view, it looks like you're moving backward because your eye was on the car beside you, which was moving forward. So you think you're moving backward, but actually you're standing still. And he's moving forward. Now, do they know what I'm talking about? Well, if you, if the car beside you starts to move forward, you just watch the car beside you. Well, he likes to say, you'll think you're backward. But if he backs up for some reason, you'll think you're moving forward. What does this have to do with Kepler? The next, oh, my. These men were my childhood heroes. So, I mean, give me some idea. I mean, I read biographies of them, uh, studied them extensively. Kepler was trying to explain a phenomenon. By the way, Kepler immediately realized, yeah, Copernicus was right, but there is a phenomenon where the planet Mars will go along across the sky, stop and back up on its path, and then go forward. And he said, how could Mars actually back up on its path? Then he discovered, folk, after 20 years of observations, he discovered three laws of motion. And I don't worry about the three laws, except know that he, for the, the only one I remember is he said that the planets move in elliptical orbits. Now, if I can get this thing to come on, I'll be showing you a better ellipse than what I've gone. Now, if you've taken geometry, you might be familiar with an ellipse. It might look like an egg. In fact, at one point, Kepler said, well, I'm going to try an egg-shaped orbit for the planets. And his figures almost came out right, but with an ellipse. Now, here's why Mars appears to go backwards. The Earth's orbit is nearly circular. Ah, okay, it did come on. All right. The Earth's orbit is nearly circular. But Mars' orbit is much more elliptical. Now, 
in Kepler's three laws where he said the planets move in elliptical orbits, an ellipse has two focal points, the sun is at one of the focal points. When a planet is at its apex, and it was farthest from the sun, it moves slower than it does when it's closest to the sun, or it's perigee, it's called the perigee when it's closest, the apogee when it's farther away. Therefore, the planet Mars will speed up when it's here and slow down when it's here, whereas the Earth's orbit, being more nearly circular, goes to the same speed. So when the Earth appears to be going backwards in the sky, it's because the planet Mars is slowing down relative to the Earth, and while the Earth is keeping a constant speed. Again, a big discovery, and when he ran it through all the figures that he and his former cohort had gone through, a man named Tycho, your book doesn't mention Tycho, it's so all either, but uh, his figures all came out. Uh, planets moving, his three laws of motion, by the way, the one of them is the planets moving in elliptical orbits, Number two, when a planet is closest to its parent body, it will move faster than it will and slow down when it's farther away. And then the third law is uh, uh, geometric. The, I tell them, I'm going to I understand it, but I'm going to skip it. Uh, it's, it's, it involves uh, squares and uh, square. Uh, anyway, I'll skip it. So there, there were three laws, but the only two that were important. This explained and convinced mankind, at least Western Europeans, that yes, it is true, the planets do in fact orbit around the sun. With the exception of the moon, they still concluded, yes, the moon orbits around the earth. Um, the moon's orbit, by the way, is also nearly circular, and that is amazing because the planet Mercury is not circular at all, Mars is not circular. Uh, but the Earth's orbit around the sun is nearly circular. The moon's orbit around the Earth is very nearly circular. Um, if it weren't, we'd have all kinds of problems. All right. I want to say this about Kepler. I mean, like anyone else, he had personal issues too. And one of his issues, after he became a famous astronomer, his mother was a used of witchcraft, and if anyone was, she probably was. Kepler used his influence to keep her out of court as long as he could, but finally a judge ordered her to appear in court, and just before the court date, she died. And I had to say, he probably killed her. I don't think so. But nevertheless, she stood no chance at all of winning a witchcraft case in court in those days, um, because, again, she was excessively superstitious. But this somewhat hindered Kepler's work for a few years. Nevertheless, we'll move on from Kepler. Galileo. Now, Galileo did not invent the telescope. In fact, he might not even have been the first person to point at the heavens. But he was the first person to point at the heavens and observe scientific observations. And the first person, you might say, who reported what he saw. Now his telescope was crude by modern standards. And yes, as a kid, I used to get magnifying glass together and I'd play the magnifying glass. I'd put two lenses, one in front of the other, and uh, put together my own little crude telescope. And I have a telescope at the house, but uh, it's getting old and doesn't want to adjust anymore. But anyway, um, Kepler, I mean, Galileo first pointed a telescope and he made numerous discoveries. Among them, he discovered the craters on the moon. And he saw black spots on the moon that are visible. The only eye, he called the black spots seas. He said, they must be seas, so the name is stuck. The names he gave to moon features are still there. But, uh, when their first astronauts landed, they landed on the Sea of Tranquility, even though we all know today that the Sea of Tranquility is not a sea. But it looks very smooth, and even from a, with our bigger telescope, the area looks smooth. And the astronauts, when they got close, found boulders as big as automobiles right in the area where they were supposed to land. But it appeared smooth as long as we were observing from a distance. Anyway, um, he had discovered the moon has craters. He discovered that Venus shows phases like the moon does. We almost never see a full Venus, because the for Venus before, I mean, on the other side of the sun, we couldn't see it. But Venus shows phases. 
He discovered four moons of Jupiter, which you can see even with a pair of binoculars. Have any of you seen any of this? I mean, looked at the heavens with a telescope. He discovered that the Milky Way, yeah, the, well, the, there's a area of stars that look like they make a pathway called the Milky Way. He discovered that the Milky Way was actually made up of millions of tiny stars. It was not just a bunch of dust, or not, it was not a pathway. It was actually made up of millions of tiny of stars. Um, but he made new, oh yeah, he discovered sunspots. And he eventually went blind from observing the sun. He did not know. He would look at the sun for maybe a few seconds and turn his head away, but that was not enough. He observed the sun for years without the aid of a dark glass. And folks, oh, don't ever do this. And let me, if there's an eclipse, don't look at the eclipse. It can blind you. Unless you look at it through the, his glass design to look at it. Uh, it can blind you, but the Galileo did not know any better, he was blinded. But he made several discoveries, like Copernicus. Now these men, Kepler was on. Copernicus had to wait till he was on his deathbed before he published his book. Galileo came into conflict with the church because they didn't like what he said, but eventually the church adopted his ideas, and the church has been terribly embarrassed because of its stance against men like Copernicus and Galileo. Now I had a pupil just this time last year stop me after class and said, I just am upset the way Christians have hindered scientific progress. And I said, you think Christianity has hindered? I said, Christianity only hindered scientific progress. But the religions stopped it cold. But there's a difference. If you measure the Christian ideas according to what they should have been, Christianity would come short. If you measure Christianity against other religions, they come short. say that in states. <laughs> but I say Christian did in fact hinder scientific progress for a time, but only for a short time. Um, all right. Then we move on to what some people believe is the greatest of all time. Sir Isaac Newton, and yes, I have one of his books in my in the library. I have read biographies of them, several of them. Sir Isaac Newton, unlike some Galileo and Copernicus, he was honored. The main thing you want to remember Newton for is the law of gravity. <clears throat> the law of gravity. He. Um, Suppose he was sitting under an apple tree one day and an apple fell on his head. We got to, well, why did the apple fall? Well, it was pulled to earth by gravity. Oh, that is old science. But now, wait a minute. Why didn't that moon up there, which was visible in the daytime, I mean, you can often see the moon. He was looking at the moon and was, why didn't it fall? <clears throat> the apple fell and then he got to read, well, wait now. The moon is in motion. <clears throat> so he deduced that the moon's motion kept it from falling, just like the motion of the planets kept them from falling into the sun. That the motion canceled each other out. And Newton's law of gravity is used today by our astronauts and our satellites to send satellites to Mars. And we have one now that's supposed to arrive in Pluto in about 17 months. It'll arrive at least in the Plutonian, so it's going to fly by. We have a satellite orbiting Saturn, Cassini. We've had satellites go to Jupiter, satellites orbit Venus, take pictures of Venus. We have a satellite now. Uh, it's either orbiting or about to orbit the planet Mercury. Are any of you aware of these? Uh, and we have one landed on roving around Mars. Yes. Wasn't there one that just left the solar system recently? Uh, the Voyagers have left the solar system. Yeah, the two Voyagers. And um, they've had a phenomenon called the Voyager effect where they seem to be inexplicably slowing down. And I'm not sure the explanation we have is good. So I'm going to grab, I know the period's about over. Newton's laws of gravity work really well inside our solar system. They don't seem to work outside. There doesn't seem to be enough gravity in any galaxy we observe to hold the galaxy together, including our own. So what holds the galaxies together? Well, they, they postulate there must be dark matter in the universe 
and dark matter would be common at 90% of the universe or more is made of dark matter. Now, how many of you heard of this? All right, there's one problem here. Dark matter has never been discovered. But without it, folk, the laws of gravity that Newton postulated do not seem to work. And we'll get to, I mean, also when you discuss about the universe expanding, what makes a string of galaxies, millions of galaxies, move at 25,000 miles a second away from us? If you don't know the answer, nobody does. They sometimes think, well, there must be a bunch of dark energy, or maybe it's the leftover energy from the Big Bang. I was reading just yesterday, 12 Unexplained Mysteries of the Universe. When you come right down to it, folks, well, what we know about the universe beyond our own solar system can be summed up in just one word. Does anybody know what word I'm thinking of? What do we know about the universe outside our solar system? One word. Thank you. All right, hey, I, I'm not against them trying to learn. I mean, I, hopefully it comes across. I do believe in learning, but when you come right down to it, we don't know. And every theory we have has some compelling reason, including Newton's gravity theory, there's some compelling reason why it cannot be true. And one thing, what is gravity? Newton didn't know. We think, well, there may be super strings, there might be something going on in dimensions, 11 and 12 dimensions outside our own. What makes one body attract another? Newton didn't know. I've got something to tell you. I'll leave you with that. Monday we'll take.